I just realized that I hadn't recorded anything today. So, uh, y'all want to see what I've been working on? For those of you who don't know, when I'm not doing, like, comic book stuff, I'm a video game artist in training. I'm going to school for it. I'm in my second to last semester. Just want, just want one more to go, and then, then I can sleep again. Oh, wait, this is the thing that I've been working on for my portfolio project for the semester. This is a little custom Maneki Neko cat that I made as well as a couple of variations on textures for him, so he can go from gold to black or white. He exists in just like this fucking void of despair, but it's got really nice lighting that I did right here. And just in case you were wondering, even for a simple scene like this, this is all the stuff that has to go into just making this look the way it does. Oh, and I also made it so it could do this. It is probably not great that I find this so satisfying, just... Oh no, our model. He's broken. Oh, this carnage is completely procedurally generated, so it's different every single time you shoot him in the goddamn face. Uh, that's what I've been doing instead of, you know, that. Sleeping. Just, just one more semester. Alright, I take that personally. Hold on. Oh, motherfucker's got no faith. Alright, hold on, hold on. So for those of you who are not aware how 3D objects get textured, the way that it works is you basically take a 3D object and you cut a bunch of lines in the polygons and then you flatten it out as flat as you can get it. In that flattened version, that's what you texture. So you know when you were a kid and you would make those little paper cubes, but before it was a paper cube, it was like a flattened out cross that you then folded into a cube? That is essentially the how UVs work. It's the fancy name for the sheet that the flattened textures are on. Most people fucking despise doing it because it's a time sink and it's annoying as hell. I, however, am a masochist and it's absolutely one of my favorite things to do. Before I dedicated to be a lighting and props artist, I wanted to be a texture artist at first. Meaning I got really fucking good at doing UVs. To the point that every single team that I've been on, I've been the guy that you hand your models to if your UV is fucked. So here, let me show you. So here's what my actual model looks like when it is not textured. Surprise, all those tiny little details are actually in the texture, not actually in the model stage. By the way, the reason this layout looks different is this is Maya, this is the modeling software, not the actual rendering software, which was Unreal Engine at the time. So if we click on the model right here, here is what my UVs look like. Now usually these are overlapping because these are two separate textures, so it doesn't actually matter if they're in the same space. This is what the cat looks like, or at least the body of it, flattened out. And I prove that by hitting this little button up here. There. See, what this does is it places a checkerboard over the entire texture so then you can see how flat your UVs actually are. If any part of the checkerboard is distorted, that means that that part of the model is stretched and you need to go back and fix it in your UVs. However, this is what my UVs look like. Look at how fucking clean those are. I don't like to brag about my artwork. Usually I'm actually pretty self-conscious about my artwork, but I do know that I, I'm pretty sure I know how to do UVs pretty well. I will say, however, if you're not looking at the UVs and just looking at the textures, they, they, they look pretty funny. This slice of American cheese is staring into my fucking soul. Just like, st stop looking at me, dude. Jesus. Those eyes are why I find comfort in shattering you. So yeah, there's actually the, the, the UVs for that thing. I'm not sure why I went on this tirade, but still. Okay, so this is kind of a short explanation, but very few people know it, so let me go into it for a second. Traditionally, when we're talking about Spider-Man 2099, we're talking about this costume. Skull spider, red stripes, web cape, that sort of thing. So initially looking at this costume, it, it's fucking blue. That's a blue costume. But in the actual text of the first couple of issues of this, it's referred to as a black suit. I don't have a copy of just Spider-Man 2099 Volume 1 just like lying around and there's not really a lot of pictures of all these text bubbles online, so you're gonna have to just take my word for it, but multiple times in his first couple of issues they refer to this suit as a black and red suit. Okay, great. Why the fuck does it look blue then? Well, it's for the same reason that Deathstroke's suit looks blue. Or the Punisher's does. Usually blue is used as the accent color for black, for shiny black. Mostly because gray in any shade of gray, at least in the early days of comics, was kind of hard to print. It's the same reason the Hulk is green. Originally it was gray, but the printing press accidentally made it look green, so he eventually became green. People called this suit blue for so long that now it is. So in short, this used to be black, but people got it wrong so many times that now it's blue. So I just had my first full night's rest since the beginning of the semester, and it is exclusively because it's the end of my semester. I slept for a whole, like, 13 hours, and like, what do y'all do with this much sleep? Like, is this what a normal functioning member of society feels like every day? Do you guys, like, not run on a caffeine addiction? That's just fucking wild to me. Anyway, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I take one character out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes at random, and then I run the fuck down. Last time we did this bit, it took me, like, 15 attempts to actually get a new character, so let's see if we have a little bit more luck this time. Who do we have today? You. Fuck! Bink, bink, you. There we go! I don't know. Flip number two. Fuck yeah, who are you? Music Master! From Regular Fellers Heroic Comics. Official publication of Regular Fellers. With a stamp of approval from the Regular Fellers of America. I don't know about y'all, but the insistence on Regular Fellers is, is a little off-putting. Giving me a real condescending version of the Comics Code Authority vibes. What? What are you... 
Oh, duck, okay, fuck off, all right? I would just really like to know where the the front of this man is. Not even getting into the guy made out of music made by the guy making music down there. I, I just want to know, like, the, his legs are down here. His head is obviously facing away from the camera, but both of his arms are facing us. So, like, I'm decently sure that this dude is an owl. Okay, for the first time in a long time, this is not somebody who was just invented to fight toothbrush mustaches. This is legit just, like, a wacky hero. I love this. All right, hold on. Created by Stephen A. Douglas and regular fellows Heroic Comics number 12 in 1942, the music master is basically just a wacky superhero. So the music master's real name is John Wallace, and in his civilian life, he is a symphony performer and music teacher. One day after leaving the symphony, he walks outside to see an old man getting accosted by just some really well-dressed coons. After saving the old man, he finds out that he is actually the famous violin maker, Antonini. Later, those same goons tried to kidnap Antonini. And when Wallace tries to save him, this time he gets fucking stabbed through the chest with a violin bow. I didn't I didn't think that that was physically possible, so like that- what? Anyway, Antonina brings him back to his workshop and then revives him with a mysterious artifact called the Pipes of Death. They're magic pan pipes. Think these, but sparkly and magical. Yeah, apparently the Pipes of Death create sound waves that match exactly with the life vibrations of the human body? It sounds legit, moving on. Yeah, so not long after Antonini gets fucking murdered, yes, yeah, some dudes break in to steal the varnish he used to use on his famous violins and kill him in the fucking process. And instead of bringing him back to life with the pipes of death, Wallace just suits up as a superhero and goes after him. And I mean suits up. He puts a fucking frock coat on. Gotta go fuck up these goons and still make it to my GQ shoot. You will never guess the powers that this dude supposedly has. All of it is music based. He's like a music vampire. He can disappear into a cloud of music notes. Send out music notes to act as sentient soldiers. He can even fly on paths of musical sound. Eventually he picks up a sidekick? His name's Downbeat. They don't really talk about him, so I won't either. Music Master lasted for about three years. And honestly, I mean, this guy's not the worst we've heard of. I, he sounds fun. We should bring him back. <laughs> okay. So I've never watched Superman and Lois. I'm sure it's an amazing show, and I'm sure that Tyler Hoechlin is an amazing Superman. This has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of the show. I don't watch it, not because I've heard it's bad. I'm sure it's absolutely amazing. I don't watch it because I have a hyper, hyper specific critique. Call it a superstition, if you will. I think that there is a direct correlation between the quality of a Superman adaptation and the neckline of the costume. You see, Superman's suit ends right above his collarbone, usually only about an inch or so above where the shield sits on his chest. This has always been a part of his costume, and in my personal experience of reading comics, the first time that wasn't stuck to, Superman sucked. Given it's not a hard and fast rule, this is fully dependent on the new 52 Superman fucking things up. However, this neckline is far too tight. Why does it sit like a t-shirt? This might be the best Superman ever, but I don't fucking know because that gives me bad vibes. I don't know, do you guys have any superhero costume superstitions or is it just me? If you take one thing from my page, it's that, it's that I'm a DC fanboy. I love me some Batman, Superman, DC, Universe, everything. And yeah, Super Pets looks great. It looks funny. It looks like a fun it, animated movie. It, feel, it feels nice. And it's going to be amazing. The animation looks great. I, I genuinely think that movie's going to be great. But if I'm standing in the movie theater line and I see you consciously pick out Super Pets over Spider-Verse 2, I am taking your nerd card by force. In what fucking world? Is that a hard decision? Did you see Spider-Verse 1? That's arguably the best superhero movie, period. You're not gonna fucking tell me Super Pets is gonna rank up. If I had two free movie tickets in a room and I had the option to watch Super Pets or Spider-Verse 2, I'd watch Spider-Verse 2 twice. I do How is this even a fucking question? Respect to the creators of Super Pets for having the balls to put it on the same day as Spider-Verse, but that is not a choice. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. What the fuck? Right, starting off, sorry for the shitty quality. I'm out in my car right now. I'm out and about, and I realize that I haven't posted anything in two fucking days. My phone is also currently connected to the car, so if my audio is desynced, that's why. I was talking with my friend the other day, and it made me have an opinion about Batman movies that I want to see in the future. I think that movies should use wires to simulate how Batman should move. Because one thing about wire physics, especially in movies where they're very much used for movement, they, they have this uncanny quality to them. It kind of has this floaty, ethereal, but still very skilled look to it, which I think would lend itself excellently to how Batman is supposed to move. His movements are supposed to be kind of off-putting. He's supposed to make you feel weird just by him being there. When I mean use wires to move, I'm talking like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, that sort of thing. I think if you shot those sort of wire movements, with the sort of horror action style of Batman, you could get some really fucking scary good shots. And my evidence for this? That is basically how Batman moves in the Arkham games. 
quick, floaty, fast, but still very skilled. I don't know, I think it would look cool. Let me know what you guys think. Okay, so I'm currently packing my stuff so I can move back home for winter break tomorrow. And I was going through all of the comics and books that I got while I was at school. By the way, these are all the comics and books that I bought while I was at school, and Jesus Christ, I think I might have a fucking problem. And I don't remember when or, or where I bought this. Uh, I'm surprised I didn't make a video on it when I did, but... Th this is the most 90s thing to ever exist, I think. I present to you all... Spawn and Batman, drawn by Todd McFarlane and written by Frank Miller. For those of you who are just as good as I am with names, that's drawn by the guy who created Spawn and written by the guy who wrote The Dark Knight Returns. That sounds awesome, right? Until you realize that both of those creators are basically the reason that comics in the 90s were comics in the fucking 90s. I mean, Jesus, all we needed was a cover by Jim Lee and a variant cover by Rob Liefeld and we would have had the four corners of what are you, a fucking square? This thing is remarkably small, so I just read through this whole thing and, uh, Wow! This is the most Frank Miller writing I, I've ever fucking heard. I think Batman calls people punk about 375 times throughout this book. Which might I remind you, is this fucking big. I don't exactly know what I was expecting from the writing, but this was before The Dark Knight Strikes Again and All-Star Batman and Robin, so I, I was really hoping for some of the, the classic, like, 300 Frank Miller. Nah. Uh, nah. This is like, just like right before he lost his shit, Frank Miller. There's a whole fight scene where Spawn and Batman are fighting and I don't think a single one of them says an entire sentence. Break you in half, I'll break you in half. Sloppy fighter, stupid fighter, no discipline. You're talking trash, you're talking trash, it won't help you. No discipline, stupid fighter, stupid punk. This reads like the fucking Doom comic. Rip and tear. I shit you not, a main plot point of this comic is Batman and Spawn fucking mind melding. It's like Pacific Rim, they drift. I've also been introduced to a new insult? Get out of my head, you twit. What the fuck does that even mean, Bats? I will admit, though, this shot's pretty fucking dope. Todd McFarlane is drawing as Todd McFarlane as ever. That's not, like, a bad thing. It's, it's Todd McFarlane. It's, it's his art style. Although I've never seen Todd McFarlane draw Batman, and I think he draws his, like, the mouth hole, like, maybe, like, seven times throughout the whole book. Bats usually looks like this. Oh, and if you're like an old-time fan, like an old-time fan of my page, you're gonna remember this bit from my dumb shit in comics series? If you ever wondered why Spawn looked like this for a while in the comic, with like, stitches or ropes or staples up his face, it's because Spawn and Batman this entire comic are constantly butting heads, and at the very end after Batman threatens him, Spawn offers to be the bigger man and bury the hatchet, which Batman responds, bury this, and lodges a fucking battering in his face! <laughs> WHY?! This is beautiful. It, it is amazing, and I love it, and you should read it because it's terrible. I don't even know what the plot is, and I've read it three times. If you ever get the chance, you should buy this, and you should read it like a fucking Bible. Alright, that's enough for tonight. Y'all have a nice night. Okay. First, let me explain my mentality on collecting comics. I am not one to collect books just because it's there. Call me old-fashioned, but I actually like to fucking read my comics. However, as a former comic shop owner and just as a general lover of comics, I also understand that the condition of a comic is extremely important to its value. So the rule I usually use is if I want to read the book, I just buy the graphic novel that has the story in it and not actually buy the comic. However, if what I'm after is the comic itself, just to have it in my collection and to own it, then I actually go out and buy the comic itself. With all of that in mind, also remember that I started reading comics at the library. I rented a lot of the books that I have read. Alright, with all that out of the way, let's get into my collection. Starting with my graphic novels, I have two on open display because I fucking love them. And believe it or not, no, neither of them are under the Red Hood. Those two being Mr. Miracle by Tom King and Mitch Gerrids, and Kingdom Come by Mark Wade and Alex Roth. I'm not gonna spoil either of these books, I'm just gonna tell you that these are two of the best graphic novels I've ever read, and that if you have the chance, you should either rent or buy them because they're fucking amazing. Ignore all the books next to them, those are our books. And yes, I do own Dreadnought and Sovereign by April Daniels, I just haven't read them yet because I don't read very many novels, I apologize in advance. These were actually donated by a fan, and I, do, I feel bad for not reading them yet, I just, I'm, I'm bad at reading novels, I like picture books, okay? Moving one shelf down, we have my full graphic novel collection. It has your basics, V for Vendetta, Watchmen, Killing Joke, all of those. Two of my favorite Batman stories of all time, right next to each other, Battle for the Cowl and the Red Hood. Oh, and if any of you are looking to get into Lobo, I recommend Volume 1 by Keith Griffin and Alan Grant. This this is the perfect Lobo book right here. It's got just all of his best classic stories. Read it if you get the chance, it's fucking great. I actually have this separated into three sections, with this being DC and Vertigo, this being all my Marvel books, and then over here being all of my third-party stuff. Two books that I fucking love that not a lot of people talk about is The Goon and Gru. 
The goon is about like a classic 1930s henchman type guy taking on a zombie voodoo lord. It's just generally a really fun read and not a lot of people know about it, so I recommend checking it out. And Gru is essentially Sergio Aragonis' comedic take on Conan the Barbarian. Sergio Aragonis being the guy who did a lot of sections for Mad Magazine back in the day. If I'm not mistaken, he currently does work for them now, still. You would honestly be surprised about how many of these I actually haven't read and that I've just bought with the intention of reading later. Anyway, there is definitely not enough time on TikTok to actually go book by book through all of this, so go ahead and pause to check out all of the stuff that I have in here. And then one shelf down from that, we have all my weird shape books and encyclopedias. By weird shape, I mean like 300, Umbrella Academy, just weird big book. And then for encyclopedias, we have like this giant DC encyclopedia fan got. I think I showed this off before, but this is like a giant poster book of classic DC cover. This is an archive of old DC action figures. And these four are character encyclopedia. And that's just the graphic novels, because if we're talking actual comics, welcome to the cave. It holds all of my long boxes. There are eight and they're all full. There is some gems in there, so let me know if y'all want a part two of me going through that. So I'm sure at this point we've all heard the news that the CW is going to be putting together a Gotham Knights TV show. Now as much shit as I've talked about the CW in the past, if they're able to make a Batman show work, I'm a little curious, I want, I want to see. Also, with it being a, uh, a Gotham Knights TV show, you can assume some of the characters that are going to show up, so uh, I just kind of wanted to make the video to... Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Leave this here. I'm not saying it's I'm the best option, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, I've already done a good number of videos showing that I that I quite quite like the character of Jason T I mean I also come with a baked in fan base so like it, it, it is an op listen I'm not I'm not begging yet um do, do you want me to is that is that what you want me to do I will I'm just giving it as, as an option my email is in my bio so uh you, if there's anyone from the CW watching I mean I'm not I'm not saying you should you want to know one of the worst parts about being a college student the worst part, just, just a, a shitty part. For the week or month leading up to finals week, you're doing nothing but studying and focusing on your fucking work. Meaning for roughly a month, you're just out of fucking commission. You are just zoned the fuck in. Then you take your finals, yay, we're done. You go on winter break and guess what? Christmas is in two fucking weeks. Oh, what, you weren't Christmas shopping while you were not sleeping all of those nights? Oh, what, what do you mean getting an education? Fuck that. Can you tell I haven't been doing anything other than Christmas shopping in a mad panic for the last two days or? Anyway, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I take one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run him the fuck down. Let's pick our superhero. Alright, you fuck, don't give me someone we already got, alright? Mini, mini, miny, you. Fuck! Starting to become a running gag. Alright, any, mini, miny, you. The Red Bee! I have actually heard of this one before. Alright, first thought, just looking at the dude. Homeboy, what the fuck are you wearing? Are those Walmart bags? Are you are you wearing fucking Walmart bags on your arm, my guy? What sort of Technicolor Tim Burton ass leggings are those? Have some fucking respect for you. You're the Red Bee. Why are you wearing green? Okay, so apparently he keeps the Walmart bags, but he changes his pants all the time. Is that the Green Hornet? That looks like the Green Hornet. Is the Red Bee fighting the Green Hornet? He is not. The resemblance is just uncanny. It's weird. Red Bee was created by comic creators Tony Blum and Charles Nicholas under the pseudonym B.H. Apiary and hit comics number one in July of 1940. His secret identity being Assistant District Attorney Richard Relay. And essentially, he, he's a vigilante. Dude just fights crime using gadgets and a cool car. And a confusingly shitty costume. Think Batman with a shittier gimmick. He does, however, have one gimmick. You see that belt? That fucking sash around his waist that has no pockets? Yeah. It's filled with bees. Bees that respond to Richard's commands. Do they explain how he does this? No. Do they explain how the bees survive stinging people? No. Is his favorite named Michael? Yes! And when I say they listen to his commands, I don't just mean he can like point them in a direction and they'll go there. I mean like one time he was tied up and one brought him a razor blade so that he could cut the ropes around his wrist. Oh yeah, and he doesn't actually need to say anything for them to follow his command. I think Aquaman with fish, he can kind of just will it to be. Did I just make that fucking pun and I didn't even realize? Son of a bitch! However, other than the literal fucking bees that he has in his pants, presumably, he doesn't really stick to his fucking gimmick all that much. Like we saw, he abandons the stripy leggings rather quickly. The only other thing he has is like a red sedan. That 
also drives itself and listens to his command? Maybe he's just like a telepath with really, really shitty marketing. He can move things with his mind, but the first thing that he saw when he did was a bee, and he was like, I got it! He appeared roughly 25 times and then disappeared, and I think he's in the public domain now. I just got back from seeing Spider-Man No Way Home. And usually I don't even like seeing spoiler-free reviews of movies, but I need to talk about this. However, I'm also going to be turning the comments off from this video because hashtag don't spoil Spidey is still in effect. Seriously, don't spoil the fucking movie. Assholes. So anyone who's followed my page for a while will know that I have not been the biggest fan of Tom Holland's Spider-Man. I have been pretty critical of him from the very start and have not really liked his first two outings. I went into this movie not excited. I went into this movie very much not on the hype train. I went because I knew it was going to be spoiled for me if I didn't go really soon. I didn't go because I wanted to see the Spider-Man movie. I didn't go because I particularly liked Tom Holland's Spider-Man. I went because I didn't want it to be spoiled. That's it. With that said, I think this might be my favorite live-action Spider-Man movie. This might be the best way that I have seen the MCU use the fact that all of its movies are connected. It very much feels like it takes place in the world of the MCU without having other characters take over. This is still a Spider-Man movie, but it's a Spider-Man movie that takes place in a world where the Marvel Universe exists. Which is not a praise that I can give to the other two outings of Tom Holland's Spider-Man where it is very much felt like Iron Man spinoffs. The movie was really able to capture the feeling of reading a comic book better than most superhero movies that I have seen, with the exception of Into the Spider-Verse. This movie might have actually made me like Tom Holland's Spider-Man. Given Andrew Garfield is still my favorite Spider-Man of all time, however, I think this movie actually made me enjoy watching Tom Holland's Spider-Man for the first time since Civil War, honestly. If you have the chance, go and see this movie when you can. Take it from someone who has not liked Tom Holland's Spider-Man since day one. This movie's worth your time. Alright, have a nice night, guys, and again, don't spoil Spidey. Okay, so I want to talk about a DC character that pops up here and there that I saw in the newest season of Young Justice that I'm pretty sure nobody fucking knows about. Mostly because I want to use it as an excuse to talk about his grim dark sidekick. And just as a reference to my older videos, this is going to be multiple parts and not a three minute video. With that out of the way, this is Blue Devil. Blue Devil is a movie star by the name of Dan Cassidy. He gets cast to play in a very special effects heavy movie called The Blue Devil. In this movie, he has to put on a full body costume that has an exoskeleton on the outside that has special effects built into it. On the set of this movie, a couple of crew members members, you know, just stumbling about the island where they're filming, accidentally set free a demon named Nebrios. While fighting Nebrios, Dan gets blasted with some sort of energy bolt that fuses the Blue Devil costume to his body, permanently, forever. It also sort of acts like the Dark Brand from Berserk, and he becomes a magnet for weirdness, and subsequently becomes a magic-based superhero. Okay, got that? Got him out of the way? Great. This is Blue Devil in his most common costume. Sort of whimsical, sort of fun, sort of silly, that sort of thing. Yeah, this is his sidekick. We'll talk about him in part two. This is part two. If you haven't seen it yet, go back and watch part one. So, what the fuck is Kid Devil's deal? Well, Kid Devil's real name is Eddie Bloomberg. Eddie actually worked as the gopher for Blue Devil on his movies. Basically, he was a delivery boy. And he got that job because his Aunt Marlo was the owner of the film company that Blue Devil worked for. Through being his gopher, he began to idolize the hero. And since apparently he had some insane technical skill that he didn't fucking tell anybody about, he snuck into Blue Devil's workshop one day and crafted himself a costume and went out as Kid Devil. That costume didn't look like this. It looked like this. How are you gonna pay homage to Robin and still be in a worse fucking costume than the kid with no pants? Anyway, obviously, Kid Devil became Blue Devil's sidekick. Fortunately, one day his Aunt Marla died in a mysterious helicopter crash that will never come back. This sent Kid Devil into a kind of dark spiral. He got thrown out of a superhero program due to psychological issues. He was rejected from the Teen Titans multiple times. Basically, really bad time. Until one day he's given a mysterious candle. He takes it to his magician friend who tells him that this candle is apparently made of demon's blood. And if he lights it, he'll be taken back to the candle's creator. Which he does. And I will explain more in part three. What the fuck are you doing here? This is part three. Go back and watch part one and two. Alright, so in an act of desperation, Eddie has lit a demon blood candle and has been brought to his creator. Who the fuck is that? That would be the demon Neron. Don't worry, you don't need to remember these names. These characters aren't important. Neron gives Eddie a deal. He'll give him power beyond his wildest dream. He'll be accepted into the Teen Titans and he'll be a respected superhero. The only part of the deal that's a little sketch is that if Kid Devil loses his faith in Blue Devil by the time he's 20, Neron gets his soul. Eddie, being the same genius who dressed like this, goes, Yeah, that's an oddly specific request. Fuck it, let's do it. And gets transmogrified into this fucking abomination. And basically gets all the superpowers you would imagine a demon can have. Fire, teleportation, he's got wings under his arms, the whole deal. Oh, and right before he teleports Eddie back, Neron lets him know that Blue Devil, in fact, is responsible for the death of his aunt. Which, when confronted about about a year later, 
Blue Devil admits to. Which obviously makes him lose his faith in his fucking hero. And he's 18 at that point, so it gives him about two years to live. God, he's so fucking grimdark. Part 4. Part 4. God, I hope this is the final part. See why I started doing three minute videos now. Anyway, Eddie's 18, he's completely lost faith in his hero, and a demon is going to get his soul by the age of 20. What the fuck is going on now? Well... Uh... Nothing, really. After that, it was really just a couple of years of him getting and losing his powers and being roped into and out of the deal with Neuron. There was one really sad moment where he tried to reconcile with Blue Devil, and then Blue Devil just kind of gave him the cold shoulder. This was before his 20th birthday, so it was a chance to save him, and Blue Devil kind of condemned him at that point. But yeah, he eventually had his powers taken away before he turned 20, I think? And he donned a modified version of his old costume and became basically the Oracle for the Teen Titan and then eventually died when Radioactive Man exploded in an act of vengeance from the calculator. Oh, and for a while he went as Red Devil. Which, when he came back in the New 52, he was just Red Devil already. Where he didn't really do much and then eventually he ended up in Sanctuary during Heroes in Crisis where he was subsequently killed. So why go on a four-part video about these guys? Because they're fucking ridiculous. And I love it and I just want to see more of them. I don't mean to make y'all excited or anything, but y'all are gonna have a pretty good Christmas. With my ominous hinting out of the way, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I take one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Let's see if this week I can finally break the curse of consistently getting characters that we've already fucking got. Alright you little piece of shit, fucking work with me here. Eeny, mini, miny, you. Madam Fatal! Dude, ma Madam, Madam Fatal. Fatal, 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 Fatal. I'm gonna go with Fatal. I'm gonna call her Fatal. Sweet merciful fuck on the first try! Fuck yeah! Okay, is this, is this Attack of the 60 Foot Grandma? What am I looking at here? What is with all these old ass covers and just giant people? If a character's not a giant, make them human size. Fuck! I don't know what that look is supposed to mean, but it kind of looks like she is going to eat these dudes down here. Where's my Godzilla vs. Madam Fatal movie? I want to see it, goddammit. So this one's new. So this is less Attack of the 60 Foot Grandma and a little bit more, and I'm taking this directly from the book here, Taken Meets Mrs. Doubtfire? Yeah, Mon Fatal holds the title of comics' first cross-dressing superhero. Ass a dude. Debuting in Crack Comics number one in May of 1940 and created by Art Panagian, Madame Fatal is actually actor Richard Stanton. Stanton is apparently a deep sea diver and ex soldier turned actor whose story fucking starts with his wife dying and his daughter getting kidnapped. Which usually starts an action story of revenge, but nah, Stanton just disappears for eight years. I don't mean like he recedes into himself, no, I mean like he goes missing for eight years. And when he reappears, he has created an entirely second life as Madame Fatal. Yeah, Madame Fatal isn't just his superhero identity, it's his other identity. He doesn't have dissociative identity or anything, he just has two lives. Fatal has an apartment, a pet parrot named Hamlet, neighbors, the whole nine yards, Stanton just all also uses the identity of Fatal to kick the shit out of the people who stole his daughter. And then after he kills the motherfucker who abducted her and gets her back, he just keeps using the identity. It was the 40s, man. Good on you. As wackadoo as the concept is, like, do you understand how brave this is? This is a man dressing as a woman, not being used as a joke, but being shown as a hero in 1940. This is legitimately impressive. And he wasn't shown as weak throughout the entire book, even as Madame Fatal, he kicked the shit out of dude. The longer the series went on, Stanton appeared as Madame Fatal less and less. And apart from a small headshot on the side, Madame Fatal never actually showed up on the cover of any of Crack Comics. However, that didn't stop him from running for damn near two years. Which for a random superhero in the golden age of comics is fucking impressive. Remember, some of these characters got like four issues. Madame Fatal got 21. A little later in the series, he started up a detective agency with his buddies Tubby White and Scrappy Nelson. Think like if Nelson and Murdoch was a detective agency instead of a law firm, and instead of Matt Murdock dressing up as Daredevil, one of their members dress up as a grandma to kick the shit out of bad guys. Given some of the other characters we've had in this book, this character is actually pretty fucking cool. So when I showed off my graphic novel collection the other day, I got this question a lot. Mostly because I said that I don't usually collect individual comic books, but I do collect graphic novels. So real quick, let me just show you the difference. This is Lobo Volume 1, Issue 1. This is a comic book. This is Lobo Volume 1. This is a graphic novel. Lobo Volume 1, Issue 1 is part of a four-part miniseries. Lobo Volume 1, the graphic novel, contains all four parts of that miniseries. That four-part miniseries then went off into its own story. This graphic novel contains that entire story in one book. Essentially, there's two types of graphic novel. There's books like Lobo Volume 1 that is a compendium of an entire story. It contains all the parts of one single story. That way you don't need to collect each individual issue of a given storyline. 
graphic novel has the whole thing. Which is really helpful if one story goes across multiple different titles. The other type of graphic novel, which is one I don't have an example for here, is one that was released as a graphic novel. It was either just a little bit too long or a little bit too complex to fit into one comic book or into a single title. And therefore, it gets released as a graphic novel. Hope that helps. Do so y'all remember when I did the behind the scenes for the Halloween video and I said y'all should appreciate the work I put in? Yeah. That goes for the Christmas special, too. Can't tell by how red my eyes are right now. I don't usually wear contacts. Welcome to Panda Red makeup tutorials. Today I'm gonna be showing y'all what not to do. One of the benefits of being so pale is that I rarely have to do my actual fucking neck with this shit. I don't know if it's that obvious, but I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing here. Thank God my car is dark so I can cover up how fucking bad this looks. Joker has looked better, but he's definitely looked worse, too. Jared Leto, eat your heart out. This looks terrible. The goal was to not look like me, and that I achieved. Thank God I am home over Christmas break so I don't have to go in the fucking public looking like this. So I actually had something to do right after I filmed the promo, so I had to take all that shit off. And then put it all back on for the actual video itself. My dedication is immeasurable. However, yet again, my fucking makeup looks amazing right now. Happy holidays, and I hope you guys enjoy the video when it comes out. Merry Christmas Eve, everybody. Wait, hold on, I'm missing something. Merry Christmas Eve, everybody. So last winter, I went on a kick where I talked about DC's Santa Claus. How he drops off cold dark side every year, how he's fought Lobo and won, all of that fun stuff. Well, this year, I want to talk about Marvel's Santa Claus. DC doesn't get to have all the fun. Marvel gets to have some fun, too. And Marvel's Santa Claus is a, is a very specific, particular being. And I want to just kind of do a general rundown on his whole deal. Starting with the fact that he's the physical manifestation of the belief in three separate beings. Yeah, I know, we're starting off wackadoo as hell. Just stick with me. I shit you not, I've looked, there's not a single picture of Marvel Santa Claus that doesn't fucking slap. Here's him fighting Blade. Anyway, this Santa Claus is the physical manifestation of the belief in three separate beings. Those beings being the real-life historical figure Saint Nicholas, Odin, and a character named Old Winter, or Old Christmas. Basically an old British character that's not super relevant anymore. After belief in all three of these beings had surfaced, Santa Claus just kind of came into being magically. He's literally the physical manifestation of the spirit of giving. And because of that, has insane magical power. He's fought characters like Deadpool to a standstill. Actually, I'm pretty sure that he's done that more, more than once. This right here is a picture of him wielding the Infinity Gauntlet while he fights off the Avengers, the Fantastic Four, Doctor Strange, and the Inhumans at the same time. Santa also has a strange and complicated and long history with Charlie Chaplin's biggest fanboy, the Twisty Windmill dude. Yeah, if you know, you know. Yeah, that guy captured Santa Claus, the, like the real legitimate Santa Claus, back in World War II to try and hurt American morale? Only to be saved by Captain America and Bucky Barnes? And then later in modern times, this version of Santa also fought with S.H.I.E.L.D. to defeat the hate monger, which is just a clone of th that guy. He's had close encounters and actual adventures with uh, just the widest range of Marvel characters. I'm talking Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, Deadpool, X-Men, the Avengers, everybody. Dude gets around. So while Marvel Santa Claus isn't, you know, going all the way to Apocalypse to personally give Darkseid a lump of coal every year, do not fuck with Marvel Santa Claus. Like, the dude can bench press two tons on Christmas. Do not fuck with Marvel Santa Claus. Alright, I'm gonna get back to editing the Christmas special. Go check that out on YouTube tomorrow. Merry Christmas, everybody. Happy holidays, and I love y'all. See, some people for Christmas, they get they get tools, they get clothes, they get art supplies, they get stuff that, you know, they enjoy. Well, I'm a nerd, and my family knows me, so. Yeah, this is not the last time you will see this. So I have a bit of an announcement to make. I've known about this for a while, just I haven't been able to tell anybody, and it finally got announced on their page, so now I can announce it on mine. Yours truly has officially been invited as a guest at NoCo Comic Con in Watertown, New York. Yeah, I know, I'm surprised too. That nerd who makes Batman skits in the middle of his dorm room got invited out to a Comic Con on the other side of the frickin' country. Yeah, I'm not cursing in this one. I'm making an announcement and I want to be invited to other Comic Cons. Sue me. NoCo Con is June 11th and 12th in Watertown, New York, and I am going to be there both days. I'm going to have a table both days, I'm gonna have a panel both days, and I might just go to the 18 and up VIP event on Saturday night. Who knows? There's going to be a bunch of events going on, there's gonna be a ton of other celebrities there. It's weird that I just said other celebrities implying that I am one. Yes, I don't like like it, it's, ah, it's weird. But hey, if you're on the East Coast or you're anywhere near Watertown, New York on June 11th and 12th, get yourself a ticket and come say hi. I am so excited that the words cannot describe it. Thank you so much to the people over at NoCoCon. I love you all and I hope to see you there.
So I need to know if I'm the only person with this hyper-specific nerd complaint. When I was a kid, when I was a nerd, I didn't really have a lot of ways that I could, like, express that. Like, I read comics at the library, I played video games when I got the chance to, I was an artist, all that normal shit, but, like, there wasn't really a lot of nerdy media for me to get my hands on. And now, as an adult nerd, there's too much, man. And I'm not saying that like I'm burnt out. I genuinely want to engage with all of it, but j there's so fucking much. Just shows right now. I just barely finished Hawkeye last night. I still haven't watched the most recent episodes of Young Justice Outsiders. I want to watch The Witcher 2. I just haven't even fucking started it yet. Doom Patrol, the new Matrix movie. Fuck Boba Fett's coming out this week. Basically what I'm saying is I just want clones so I could, you know, engage with all of the media and then absorb all of it. I'm so happy that there's so much nerd stuff now. It's just, I don't, I literally do not have time in the day. So yeah, any mad scientists out there, hit me up for a willing participant in a cloning experiment. All right, that's all I had to say. Y'all have a nice day. So I didn't actually originally plan to like disappear for a day, but let's just say that the Guardians of the Galaxy game is really fucking good. Like I fell into a trance and have basically been playing it for two straight days. If you get the chance, pick it up and play it because hol holy shit, it it's really fucking awesome. Go check out the Collector's Emporium on Nowhere. It's basically just like a den of comic book references. They have like Raptor's Gem and Throg there. Yes, yeah, so it, it's it, basically it's awesome. With all of that said, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I take one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Let's pick our hero. You are going to give me someone new, damn it! And on the first try, come on. Any Mini, miney, you. Ne ne Nirvana of the Northern Light. I, I think I'm saying that right. Nirvana, Nirvana, yeah. I know that what's behind her name is probably supposed to be the Northern Lights, but that just straight up looks like she blew something the fuck up and is basking in the glory. Dog don't give a shit though. Dog's not even looking in the same fucking direction. Dog's concerned of whatever the fuck that is that's falling out of the sky. Lady, are you wearing a dress that barely passes your ass in somewhere that sees the Northern Lights? I don't know very much about geography, but I know that anywhere you can see the Northern Lights is most likely cold as fuck. Respect, lady. God damn. Okay, so... So Nirvana's actually fucking badass. This is dope as fuck. So Nirvana of the Northern Lights was created by one Adrian Dingle in Triumph Adventure Comics number one. She is actually Canada's first female superhero. And even though we've already seen the first female superhero period, she actually also beat out Wonder Woman by a couple of months. Being made in 1941, she was created after trade embargoes made it so that American-made comics couldn't be shipped to Canada anymore. So Canadians came up with a bunch of their own superheroes, Nelvana being the third of those. She's also very heavily tied to the native culture and mythology of Canada. I'm about to drop a bunch of names and I apologize in advance if I get any of them wrong. Her origin says that she's the demigod daughter of Koliak and the embodiment of the Northern Lights. Nelvana and her brother Tanaro are charged with the mission of protecting the Inuit people of Canada. And the arsenal of powers that she has to do that are off the fuck in charts. She can fly at light speed. She has invisibility. She has telepathy. She can control the weather. She's basically her own X-Men team. Brother Tanaro has all of the same powers. And one extra one. Kind of pow. It, it's technically a curse. That dog there? Yeah, that's Tanaro. He has a curse on him that says that he cannot be perceived in his human form by white men. That's the exact wording. He exists under a curse that prohibits him from being seen in his human form by white men. Here it is in the actual text, too. That's a hell of a power, buddy. Nirvana doesn't have the same curse, though. And apparently, Nirvana kicks some fucking ass. She's fought entire armies. She fought the Axis power. She was a secret agent. She defended Earth against an alien invasion. I don't know where this character went, but I need her back. Maybe this time have her actually written and drawn by an Inuit creator, but otherwise this is badass. Not regrettable. Panda seal of approval. And that is going to be it for this month. Thank you all so very much for watching. I just wanted to take a moment to thank all of my lovely supporters over on Patreon. Alicia Vandekop, Allison Knopp, Ash Dolworth, Bill Bro, Blue, Brandon Laney, Cassie Pace, Chaz Masters, Cody Kodak, Cyberwolf, Danny Walker, DeCassowary, Diandra, Dragon Fang, Dustin Brothers, Edgar Lacone, Fancy Man, Gas Boss Gate Light Girl Keep, Gummy Bud, Justin Smith, Jenny Chanti, Cat Stevens, Christina Odd, Linda Mackert, Ma Gu, Mary Baldwin, Matthew Church, Pandora A, Shannon Lindsay, Silver Bullets 23, Sring, Tarara, The Firebranded, Teresa Harrison, The Rider of Darkness, Tyler Bryan, 
Victor Villarol, and Zen, as well as all of my other lovely supporters over on Patreon. And if you would like your name set out in the credits of every single YouTube video, feel free to hop on over to my Patreon and donate at least $15 or more, or hey, even donate as little as $1. Anything helps. All of your guys' generosity and support is the reason that I'm able to continue doing what I love here, so thank you for any support that you can give. With that said, I think that that is going to be all for this month. Thank you all again so much for watching, and I will see you next time.